Okay, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for being here today with us at the Booth Western Art Museum. We've got a full house here in person and a lot of people watching online, so we really appreciate you spending part of your Wednesday here with us today. Um, my name is Kent Mullinax. I'm the manager of the Booth Art Academy. If you're not familiar with the Booth Art Academy, uh, we have adult programming year round and we have uh, anywhere 45 to 50 programs every year, so almost something every week, uh, typically in the form of three-day workshops. So whether you're an expert or a beginner and want to try something new, we have something for pretty much everybody, uh, any skill level and all mediums. So if you want to know more about that, you can grab me afterwards or you can see boothartacademy.org for everything that we have going on. And so today, uh, this is the next installment of our Art for Lunch series, and we're trying something a little bit different today. We have somebody here in house with us that's going to be doing a painting demo. Uh, this is Margaret Dyer. Uh, if you don't know Margaret, she is a local artist here in Atlanta, and she is equally adept at both uh, oil and soft pastels. And so as far as I'm concerned, she's one of the best figure painters around, so we're very lucky to have her with us today. And so Thank you. Without oh, further ado, on. this is... <laughs> Uh, this, is, uh, this is Margaret Dyer, and she's going to spend the next hour uh, painting for us, and at the end I'll come back up and we'll take a few minutes to, and we'll answer some questions if anybody has anything from the audience. So without further ado, let's give a big hand okay, to Margaret. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Oh, am I too loud? Okay. Thank you for coming, you guys. I, I, I'm honored. Um, and let me just tell you, before I, everything I, I'm going to do a pastel demo, not an oil, because I see that there are several pastelists here. Um, I, and everything I do is about value. And I don't know if you know what value is, and I didn't know what value was when I was a student. I, when I was a teenager, I took a class from Roman Shatov, who was the only painter in Atlanta who was teaching artists, you know, so it's just about everybody who was an artist studied under him in the 60s. It tells you how old I am. Um, so I, my first class, I went in there, I, I had my list, I had gotten everything on my list, my canvas, my paints, everything, and I walked into the class, I was late, and he was at the far end of the class talking by um, the vibrancy of the pastels and the energy, you know, they're not what I thought pastels were. I always thought of pastels as the Breck girl on the shampoo, you know, it's all smeared and pretty, but um, these were like powerful. So, so let me show you something about, about Balyu. All right, can you see the, the, the paper here? Am I on? Are you going to put, okay, okay. So I'm going to, I break everything down into three values. I start with, uh, there's a light, light value. There's a middle tone, let's find a middle tone in my box. Middle tone. Dark. Can you all see? Okay, so that's, that's pretty elementary, okay? But what I do with, with my pastels is I start layering colors. And so when I layer colors, and I do this with oils as well. It's, um, this is unnerving to see my own picture in the monitor. It's like really, really, I'm going to be depressed when I leave here. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I layer colors. And so what I do is I only light, put light colors on top of light colors. So if, if I squint when I'm looking at it and it disappears, then it's the same value. So I'm going to, I can put green on top of that pale blue. I can put, let's do a pink test, disappears, pink on top of green. I could do, let's go into the, a, another kind of green. How about, there's a little too light. Let's go to lavender. So I've got, I could layer and layer and layer and never make mud. And I don't know, I, how many of y'all are artists? Okay. So, so you know what mud is. <laughs> um, so I will never make mud as long as my values are the same. 
and I never put a light on top of a middle tone because, do you see what happens there? Um, because then you start losing your, your um, illusion of three dimensions. So here, these are the lights I used right here. Green on top of a middle tone, I never do it. Okay, so I only put middle tones on middle tones. Let me find a middle tone that disappears. I'm applying it and I'm squinting, a little too light. Too light. Disappears, can you see that? So I'm gonna put that on top of my middle tone blue. And if I put a middle tone on top of a light, then I can see it from across the room. So I, I don't do that. I just layer color, lights on lights, middle tones on middle tones, and darks on darks. And I won't make mud, okay? So let me show you how I implement that. So layers of lights, middles, and darks, okay? That's my sister. She's, she's just not some stranger telling me what to do. <laughs> okay. All right, so, and I was doing light, middle tone, dark. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna, I start by drawing. I think I'm gonna go horizontal with this. And you guys, take a cue from Emily, my sister. If, if you have questions during this thing, feel free to, to ask, okay? Why? So I work out, I like the drawing that's involved in, um, in working with pastel. With oils, are there any people here that were hoping I was going to do oils today instead of pastels? Um, sorry, I have. <laughs> it's like I was going to wait and see what, how many, and, and there are more pastelists in here. But everything I do with pastel, I do with oils. I layer my colors the same way. I look for gesture, an interesting gesture with dynamic angles. I look for strong value, contrast in values. I look for maybe a dominant light and three quarters of it being dark, you know, or vice versa, three quarters of it being light and then a dark, one quarter, no, thirds. I'm sorry, Michael Adams, the thirds. Um, and, and, you know, when I take my pictures, I don't pose my models. I don't say, oh, I do this, now do this. Um, because I want them, each model has his or her own way to move, you know? And so if I try to put them into a position that's not natural for them, it just doesn't look natural. So I give them, I'll, I'll hire a model for an hour, pay them $100, um, and get 400 pictures. And maybe 10 of them are good. Pardon me? raise it to can you hold that up for thank you 
Oh, now I'm throwing the camera off. <laughs> okay, is that better? Okay. So if I were working with oils, I would tone my canvas to the dominant value of the reference that I'm using. On a scale of 1 to 10, it might be a 7. I would t I'd tone my canvas to that. And um, I'll, I'll do it loosely, so it'll, like, it'll maybe help me start loose and not tighten up right from the beginning. Um, and I'll, I'll scribble in my this step. I'll scribble in my composition with the transparent red oxide. And I'll work out a value study with transparent red oxide until everything is right. Everything's almost ready to be framed. It's, everything's looking so beautiful, I don't want to put color on it. But I, I, that's just a preliminary. If everything is working right and all my values are correct, then I start laying color on top of it. So I'm kind of going to do that with pastels. So I'm going to start blocking in my values. I'm going to work upside down. And I'm going to look for my darks. What surface are you working on? Sennelier Carte. So all my darks, and purple was an arbitrary choice. My students work upside down a lot because I think what happens when you work upside down, oh, let's get rid of that. Um, it, it triggers your brain, it tricks your brain. You can't understand what you're seeing, so you're having to, instead of relying on your understanding of what you're seeing, you have to rely on what your eyes are seeing. So I have my students work upside down a lot, and I think doing that on a regular basis um, helps you see better, helps you rely on your eyes rather than your understanding, because, I mean, if you've ever tried to draw a portrait of somebody, you know, they're sitting right in front of you and you're drawing them and it looks nothing like the person, it's because you're, you're thinking this is the way a nose is supposed to be drawn, and this is the way, these are how, you're not drawing what you're seeing. So you have to train yourself to see. Let's turn it right side up again. So I am going to, so I've got my darks in, for the most part. And my next objective is to try to cut, get the value the way I, I understand it to be. You know, like how dark it, should this be compared to black? So I'm going to put black in there somewhere. 
if I have one. This goes black back here. Not everything that's dark is black. It's pretty black back here too. So then once I have my black in, and on, in this particular piece, there's lots of black. Sometimes there's very little black. So I'm going to go into my darks again. I'm still in my darks. I'm going to try to determine where my middle tones are. I'm thinking this in the foreground is middle tone. The floor becomes a middle tone. Um, you, know you know what I could be doing. I don't know why I didn't think of that. That's, can you see better? Okay, sorry. So, I'm going to um, jump into my lights. I usually, I work step by step, and I teach my students step by step. We start with darks, then we'll go to black somewhere, and then, then we'll build color in the darks, but I'm gonna kind of skip that. My next step would be to go into the lights, only because I have never been able to figure out where the middle tones were, and so I always figure if I do my darks and my lights, what's left over is middle tone. So, and I, I, I had to figure that out because when I started teaching, I thought, how am I going to teach anybody what I'm doing when I don't understand it either? So th th that's just what I do darks, lights, middle tones. So let me go into my lights. Well, the lightest thing is this back here, and I should have left. I shouldn't have put some black in there. And let's see, the rug. is not as light as that, so I'm going to step down in value a tiny bit, but it's still be con considered a dark, I mean a light. And that's about all the lights there. Maybe this pillow through here. I'm not concerned about color. I'm, this is all arbitrary because when I start layering color, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to push it more toward a, a pink or I'll push this more toward a green. Then in, in that process, though, I'm going to have all these beautiful colors that got me there. So, um, and let me tell you about color. I, I, I've, yeah, I, I've been doing pastels for like 40 years. Oh, I can't believe I've been doing it that long. Um, 40 years. Um, and when I was a student, values came real easily to me. And I'm sorry to bore you guys if you're, if you're not artists and you're not interested in value and stuff like that. You, you want me to expedite this and get on with the drawing? <laughs> oh. um, so, um, Values came easy to me, but color didn't. So I, I, I would go home really upset trying to figure out how, how do I choose colors? Grass is green, the sky is blue, but you know, not always. So um, I didn't know how to make those choices in color once I had had my values in. So, but my teacher kept saying, it doesn't matter what color you use, as long as the values are right, your piece is going to work. So I, I 
tested her on that. So, so I would go to class and I'd drew everything in brown, and then I'd think, okay, well, what is, I'd get my values right, and I'd think, what is um, the most clashing color I could find to put on top of this of the same value? And so I pulled out a purple. I thought I would never put a purple on a brown. So but if it's the same value and it disappears, I can put it on top. And what I saw happen was this little visual vibration, this kind of buzz. Um, and it kept happening as long as I was making the same values, so mixing these colors. I, and I didn't understand what I was doing until, again, I had to start teaching, and I, I couldn't figure out, how am I going to teach this if I don't understand what I'm doing? So I got out the color wheel, and I held it a certain way and realized all this on this side was warm and all this on this side was cool. And what I was doing is I was starting with a warm brown and going to a cool purple. And those two values, those two colors of the same value made this vibration happen. Okay? So are you totally bored? Okay. <laughs> no. No. But when I set up a, a photo session, um, I have my spotlight with a 250 watt, or rather 200 watt or 150 watt bulb. Let me go back into some lights here. Let me go back into my lights. This was middle tone that I was putting on there. So when I do a photo session, um, I get that spotlight right on her so I have really good value, I mean, good shadows, you know, I'm looking for shadows all the time. So I, I've gone, I've started on her skin tones and I'm starting with warms. And I don't know if everybody here knows what warm colors and cool colors are. You want me to explain that, or do I, you want me to just skip over that? What do you <laughs> uh, huh? Okay. Wait, warm colors, think of the sun, think of fire, okay, reds, yellows. Cool colors, think ice, blue, okay? So if, if a color has a lot of blue in it, it's cooler probably than something that has more red and yellow in it, okay? So everything's relative. So I've started with warm colors on her face. I want to cool her down a little bit, and I'm going to go to a green. I'm going to test this first, make a mark. It's too dark. It's going to be too dark. It's a little bit light, but I think I can use it. right on top of the, um, the warm colors of the same value. Margaret, how many distinct colors do you have in this palette? Right now? One, two, three. Margaret, I'm sorry, how, how many? In, to, to pull from? Who's, I'm trying to, is that, who's, who is that? Steve. Okay. Um, I don't know, I haven't counted. By the time I'm finished with this, I probably will have used 15 colors. I'm getting tangled up here.
Let me get some of that red in there. Which is a middle tone. And, you know, I, I see some pastelists that have, um, oh my God, hundreds if not thousands of pastels, you know, and it's like, oh my God, it's like a scanty store walking into their studios. But, but I, I use this box, you know, and it's really too many pastels for me. Um, I don't use most of them. So if I were doing this with oils, Again, I would have worked out an entire value study in transparent red oxide, adding burnt umber to the transparent red oxide to go with my real darks, adding white to my transparent red oxide to make my middle tones, and my lights I would have rubbed out from the canvas, back down to the canvas. That's why I use Centurion oil-primed linen canvas boards, because you can wipe your, your paint right off back to the, to the canvas, and it's white. So I'll make my value study, and then once everything's right, then I'm gonna mix my colors and match to them. I'll try to, uh, the face, I'll start, it's, I started with the transparent red oxide warm. So I'll, my next step might be to go to a cooler color, a green or a blue, and I put it right on top, making sure it disappears, and I'll, I'll let my paintbrush just, I won't even let the paintbrush touch the canvas, it's the paint that's touching the canvas, and I'm gonna lay it down on top of it. And because I added greens to my middle tone value face, I'm going to add green to my light skin also, just to have some continuity between, between uh, all the skin tones. So it's too warm, I'm going to cool it down, test, disappears, I can use it right on top. I don't want to obliterate what's underneath it because I want to find that, that buzz. Missing some darks here that I, I didn't see before. down on top of this purple back here because it's a dark of the same value. Something back here can go a little bit warm. No. <laughs> I, 
Um, but in my drawing, in the, the first stage when I'm drawing, I, I will be looking for that, you know. But after my drawing is constructed, and, I've, I've, what I, and I failed to say that I would outline the dark shadows, and then I'll mask them, and then I'm into shapes, not, not angles anymore. And when I pick up a color to use somewhere, I move it around so that I can develop harmony in my palette. I never pick it up, apply it, and then put it back into the box. Actually, I'm trying to expedite this, so I'm doing it a little differently than I would. Um, I, I would spend more time drawing, more time constructing, more time finding the shapes of things. Okay, so I, I'm, I use this gold color for the chair or the sofa. I want it to be rosy color. But I'm, and I'm going to work my way toward it. So, and it's too warm. I want to cool it down. So this disappears into it. I can put it right on top. And I have a light hand. You know, it's like um, I put put lots of layers on because my hand is light. How does it look from back there? Is it making sense to you guys? Questions? Y'all are quiet. Pastels are very forgiving. If, uh, if you make a mistake, it's easy to cover them up. N not, not as a habit, but um, sometimes I will use the same reference to do both. Not where I was. I'm 
putting a blue on top of her, her um, oh, I know what I was going to do. So I'm not afraid of, of color. Some of the colors in, in a pastel box are neon looking. I'm not afraid of them because I can pick up a neon pink and my next movement will be to put a green on top of it and it neutralizes and it gives you this beautiful vibration, you know? So I, I love to, to make that happen. Can't, how am I doing with time? Okay. So I want to tighten this up a little bit. I use black a lot, and I know some painters have been told to never use black, but I beg to differ, um, because you make it black anyway. You, you have to have that black, so you're making it out of your, what, alizarin and whatever, you know? You're making a black, so they just don't want you to use it straight out of the tube. So I start with the big, big shapes, work my da way down to smaller shapes. I get some black in there. I wind up with all these pastels in my hand. I like to do pieces where I can't even see the face of the person. I like, you know, sometimes a model will pose and they, they think you want the face all the time. So, you know, no matter what they're doing, they've got the face of the camera. <laughs> so it's nice to find somebody who's totally not self-conscious in front of a camera to work with. make some of the pink test. I don't know if you guys can see that, but 
right through here. There's this pinkish color, there's green, there's blue. And um, that's where I see that little bit of magic, that little bit of, little bit of uh, excitement. So when I layer colors, I do it very lightly so that those colors will show through. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> I, like, I like to work from photos because I, my first husband, brother-in-law, was a therapist. And he came to visit us one day. And, and I had all my work done in the studio. It was when I was pretty much a purist, and I only worked from life, you know? So you had these models sitting in, the, in a chair, the, the, kind of the same pose over and over again. And so he comes down, and he looks at it, and he's really quiet, and he goes, they're all so sad, you know. So he was in, inferring that I'm sad, you know. And I said, no, no, but they're, they're bored. They were sitting there for four hours, you know. So, but it was like there was nothing I could do to persuade him that there was not something very sad about me. But um, so, and then, and so I swore, I, I'm, I'm, work, I'm working from photographs, I'm going to capture life. And then I was in New York once, and uh, I was passing by, I don't know if it was the Metropolitan Museum or if it was MoMA, and there was a big, huge banner in the front that said, Degas Photography Exhibit. And I thought, how, how cool, he must have had a grandson that's a photographer. I'm going to go in there and see what he does. So I walked in there, and it was Edgar Degas, and with the nudes, bending over for the tub, you know. He was using photo references for his paintings. And so you can get a book on his photographs. So I walked out of there feeling vindicated. <laughs> Some people do. Um, I squint a lot, and that helps me see values. Um, yeah, you still have to squint at a black and white photo. I, I wish I were that creative. I, 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 do. I stay with the photo the whole time. And I need to push myself out of that. But that doesn't mean that I replicate the photo, you know. I'm, I'm not trying to replicate. I'm getting, I'm getting um, my gesture, my values, my composition, you know. Not lately. I used to, I used to listen to court TV. <laughs> and I would listen to the murder trials that would go on for like three weeks. Um, sometimes I do. Sometimes I forget to put the music on. Gary, can you see the vibrations I'm talking about? Do you know what I'm talking about? 
Gary is a member of the Southeastern Pastel Society in Atlanta. Good bunch of pastel artists dedicated. Great shows every year. Is it every year, Gary? Actually, Gary was past president of the group. Pardon me? <laughs> Let's turn it upside down and see how things are looking. That's not it. Can you all hear me breathing? <laughs> Can you? No. Um, working upside down, if you take a complicated city scene like New York City, traffic, buildings, everything, which looks insurmountable, turn it upside down and work for an hour or two upside down and squint at the thing and you will wind up with a dynamic cityscape. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. So you guys, you oil painters, are you getting anything out of this? Okay, okay.
test. Pink and green. Well, like I said, I, I have a step-by-step -step process, and it's, real, it's seven steps, and if you take my class, I give you a, sh a handout. Uh, <laughs> but when I go through all seven steps, when I complete it, it's just ab about done, and I'll look at it upside down and loosen things up if I need to or tighten things up, you know, but I go through my seven steps. Which are, all right, drawing, outlining my shadows and my darks and massing them in, finding black somewhere. Then I'll go back into my darks and start layering color. Then I'll go into my lights. I think I'm missing a step somewhere. <laughs> I'll go into my lights and layer colors, okay? And then middle tones. So yeah, I didn't, and then, then the seventh step is, um, Fine-tuning, like looking for reflective light and turning edges and, you know, just making it more believable. Yes. Yeah. I'm terrible at portraiture. I, I, I am, I am. I mean, I can get 99% of it, that, and it looks great, and then that last 1%, it's like you have to make that little nudge of the nose, it, it ruins it, you know, and then you, you wind up spending three weeks trying to f get it back, you know, and it's like, I, it's like that last 1%. I, I'm not a good portrait artist. Although I'd like to be. I really would. I admire somebody who can do a good portrait. So I'm tightening things up, Gary, you know, just so that I don't have so much paper showing through. A little more detail. So little things like when I want to fine tune something, let me cool down her face a little bit first. Green on top of pink. I want to suggest that her face is turning away from the light. So I want to put a middle tone edge on it. And, um, and I'll find something that's a little different than what I have on my paper. So let me go to a, how about a green, middle tone, edge it. And if I don't like that, then I can find another middle tone, put it right on top of that, lose it. Go 
darker. I'll put those flowers behind her. And those white flowers are not light. Too light. define her hand a little better. Pull that down. And my eye pops around, you know, it's like I don't work on one little area and finish it because because I'm distracted by another area. So I'm, I'm doing this, I think, oh my God, that, that, I have to do that. So I'm hopping around all the time, moving that pastel around. Let me get some of the fabric on her. I mean the flowers on the pattern. Thank you. I forgot about it. Who was that? <laughs> you can tell it's yellow all the way back there. Are 
Yeah, I usually save that till last. No, I would, I would go, that, that would be my fine tuning at the end. I know for me, I've had the good fortune of watching Margaret demo many times over the years. And there's always that moment with her work where, you know, I'm watching her draw paint and I'm listening to her talk and I'm not seeing it. And then she's working some more and I'm not seeing it. And then she's turning it upside down. And I'm really not seeing it. <laughs> and there's that moment where she turns it right side back up. And it's like, boom, there's that ta-da moment. And that's... It's always very exciting watching her work. So, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else back here? Yes. Yes, yes. we can come up yes. at the end. And also, I do want to remind everybody that uh, Margaret does have a workshop at the Art Academy. It actually starts two weeks from today. It's the 16th, 17th, and 18th, and uh, she'll be teaching in both oil and pastel. So we do still have a few spots left for that. If anybody would like to sign up, I also have a, a website. You can you can download little videos or I have some real fast motion things that you could that are free you know but you can I'm in the process of putting more videos up demos okay so we'll wait, 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 one more okay. no yeah glass yeah um, yeah and I'll put a spacer if I have one, between the glass and the art. Never spray. I've seen too many pieces get ruined that way. Okay, so we'll set the easel down here on the floor, so you're welcome to come up and take a look at it. Everybody give it one more big hand. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Were you, were you guys trying to say something? Oh, 